Hello and welcome to Pedro's Pit Stop. Uh, my name is Pedro Pastilla. I'm a, a long-term motorsport fan and I also head up a product market strategy at Vestit. This puts me in an ideal position to be able to bridge um, the incredible world that is Formula E with the incredible world that is Vestis and our contribution to sustainability and to a more sustainable world. So the ambition of this podcast series is that we bring you a little bit of the news and activity that happens in the exciting world of Formula E and the Mercedes EQ Formula E team and how that connects with the incredible work that we do at Vestis. Um, this will explore elements of racing, it will explore elements of sustainability, and it will explore how we can connect the two worlds in things like um, the values that are important for a racing team to maintain a winning spirit and the technical aspects of racing that are really relevant to the work we do at Vestas and the knowledge we have at Vestas in things like weather knowledge that are relevant for a Formula E racing team like the Mercedes EQ Formula E team. So for this first session, I had the pleasure to, to talk to, to Nick De Vries. Nick is, of course, uh, the Mercedes EQ Formula E team uh, driver, um, reigning world champion, uh, and of course, won the, the, the opening e -Prix this year. Um, we had a talk just before the Mexico e -Prix and we talked uh, about um, the elements that are strictly needed to form a winning team, what motivates Nick, and, uh, and how relevant some of those are, the aspects are to, to the work that we do at Vestas. Well, first and foremost, congratulations and uh, and happy birthday or belated birthday, right? It was this week, as, uh, yeah, as thank I've you. seen. Yeah, so a lot last, of last Sunday, a lot of things to celebrate. Right? I think awesome start to the championship. Uh, a nice birthday present for that first win, I guess. And, uh, and uh, uh, well, it was a it was a week in between, but it's it's definitely always encouraging to to start the season well, especially because. There's been a long break. Um, mm. We are obviously coming in as kind of reigning champions in, in both championships. And then the qualifying format has, has changed, which is uh, supposed to make things a bit more uh, equal and fair for everyone. Um, so yeah, then naturally, obviously, there is a bit of pressure and there are some expectations for us to do well. Um, I didn't help myself to, I actually hit the wall in FP1 yeah. in lap one. So I felt like I, I had to come from far, but um, yeah, it, it, it definitely felt like uh, a bit of a relief to, to have such a strong start and first day. Obviously, the second day was a little disappointing, but um, yeah, we, we feel like we have a good understanding of, of why we were not competitive enough. Because yeah. I think from outside, sometimes it's it's difficult to understand that from one day to another, the difference is so big, but yes. it, it often... I think sometimes on TV the, the the big picture can can mislead the 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 true kind of performance because on the first day I think we were good but we also were helped slightly with a slower car behind us that held up um, majority yeah. of the grid um, and on on the second day we we didn't just yeah we just simply didn't make the right uh, changes um, that that yeah had to had to be done with the evolving track conditions and, and, and yeah, different circumstances. So um, yeah, we, we learned from that, but uh, overall it was a, a positive start. With, with qualifying being so different in the groups, how, how do you prepare for this? It's still very new to everyone. Um, we, on a single race day, we have two sets of tires and on a, on a double header, we have three sets of tires. And in Formula E, basically the older your front tires are, the, the the more performance they, they get because the profile is reducing. So you, you get more contact patch. Um, so so there is there are a lot of different kind of strategies how to how to use your tires throughout a qualifying session, but also how to approach a qualifying session. And in Saudi it was even more difficult because normally um, due to the kind of increase of temperature over over the laps, the first lap is always the quickest. But in Saudi, the, the tarmac was a bit particular and, and actually we were able to go quicker in the second and, and maybe even the third lap. So that led to, to a lot of different kind of strategies in the session. Um, and that was um, yeah interesting to see and, and also uh, yeah uh, challenging for us to, to make the right calls. How do you deal with that? That's always something that I found special about race drivers. 
the, the consistency. It's maybe not the adjective you hear the most, but it's at least from, from my perspective, one of the things I admire the most is how do you maintain that, you know, capacity to, to deliver lap after lap consistently and, and especially then when you have changing conditions. I, I personally think that is the, the biggest differentiator between a very good and a good driver. I think um, in, in standard or normal circumstances, um, everyone is able to deliver a good uh, lap time. But uh, in our world, conditions and circumstances are always different. So you always need the ability to read the conditions and be able to adapt as quick as possible. Um, and I think you, you see that in, in you know every kind of uh, racing series when when it starts raining or when the track is drying. You always have these certain drivers that you know that 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 kind of come above um, and and that that yeah that make a difference. And and I personally believe that is also applicable when. For example, when you have two dry days, the conditions is the conditions are still different in every time you're out on track. And I think having the ability to 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 be open minded and read the conditions, having the confidence to try and yeah extract um, uh, yeah that in your advantage is uh, is key. The reason I'm asking is this is something that's maybe surprisingly, but it's extremely relevant to us in our area of the business because you know and then the hopefully in the back of a pandemic and you have typical limitations on material availability transport around the world in terms of value chain restraint you have a very rapidly evolving renewable market um, and and of course us as a company it's a priority to navigate these changes in the best possible way and uh, and accommodate so i at least see a lot of parallels to, to what you're describing right about having that open-mindedness i think it's it's inspiring to hear um, these thoughts life is never straightforward if whether it's in in sports in business or or anything it's it's you always um uh, have the yeah certain obstacles and, and hurdles you need to overcome and you never know when they're gonna come uh, and you need to be prepared to yeah uh, adapt and be um flexible to to um, to adapt to new circumstances and new situations and uh, ultimately i think as, as a company but also as a driver and a racing team that's where you can make the difference um yeah against your your competitors so how does this leave you and now the the and the team now we, we had you know two good two good week two good braces sorry um i think it's also to a good start on the back of a um, on the back of a very, very good championship ending. How's how's the confidence? I'm always very um, grounded and, and I always very much focus on on the present. Obviously, we have a goal this season, but um, I think in order to achieve that goal collectively, we we need to stay focused on, on the present and on, on what we are doing today and what matters today and uh, trying to, to basically optimize our performance uh, every every day and every time we're out on track if we are just thinking about a championship then that is distracting us from uh, the process to achieve the goal but honestly the, the, the difference are very minor so it's all about race operations and making the right decisions on the right in the right moments so uh, there there is a, still a, a huge challenge ahead of us and, and a long season so we can't take anything for granted in saudi you kind of had that incident right at the start of the weekend how do you recover from that of course i felt uh, responsible and and uh it was my mistake and and it could have easily <coughs> turned the other way like we could have had a very tough first day because of my incident if if it was just certainly harder we maybe had to change um or maybe we maybe had maybe had to use a joker for our bu which then gives a gives us a, a grip penalty oh. If there was a red, red flag in FP2, then my front tires would have been brand new and then they wouldn't be the you know, giving us the grip we, we, we required. So it could have easily, easily, you know, uh, put us in an extremely tough situation. But ultimately, yeah, you try to look ahead. You, of course, I felt bad, but I, I took all the data um, from FP1. I, I analyzed it carefully. I, I really tried to learn from from everything that um, yeah that we had seen in FP1, so I, I watched the whole FP1 back, 
um, and and I just did my homework, and then the next day, yeah, you build up your confidence slowly, and then uh, when when it basically you you always keep a bit of margin, and then when you go into quality, you need to, you know, you, you need to put that aside. There is no room for margin anymore. Then you need to to do it, uh, and then yeah, suddenly you just need to to turn the switch around, and then uh, you just try, and and sometimes you succeed, and sometimes you don't. Where do you draw inspiration from? Who's the kind of influential people that that you look up to and and inspire you? I have a lot of respect for um, athletes in general. I follow a lot of sports, especially now during the Olympics. Uh, I'm very sovereignistic and I like to follow all uh, our Dutch athletes. Um, speed skating is our strongest um, yep. discipline. That, that, that is, I have huge, huge respect for, for all of them. Speaking um, of consistency, and, right? <laughs> yeah, well, they, you know, you, you train four years for something and then uh, suddenly you, you're there and they fire the shot, you go and, and then you have like three or five minutes depending the distance or even less to 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 kind of excel what you've been working for for four years and 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 then to to then find athletes that are able to always deliver in that moment is is very unique and special but speed skating is even uh, the, the reason why i'm even more kind of attached to speed skating is because uh, speed skating is mainly uh, isolated in the north of the Netherlands and all the athletes train let's say 10 to 15k from where I've been born and raised so I, I pretty much know all of them and I know how hard they work so I would say Dutch speed skate is my biggest inspiration but you know I, I love watching sports in general I, I like watching documentaries on on any sports and athletes and obviously the last dance from Michael Jordan and reading books about tennis players, football players, just, I, I like sports and, and I, I always have a lot of um, interest in everyone's journey because, um, you know, the, the world only sees the journey, not the journey, the, the, the athlete, the sportsman, the racing driver um, excelling at the highest level in his or her sport, but, but what he or she had to go through to, to reach that point is is often very uh yeah very unique and very uh, very tough now there's a really good quote i think it's from yen Ferdino, the, the iron man um champion multi-champion says that i'm not oh, made of the know. hours that you see i'm made of all the hours that you don't see or right, something yeah. along those lines which is exactly to your point right it's the, all the hours they have that no one ever sees of, of training dedication suffering getting out of bed when you don't feel like getting out of bed Th there is pressure and and but we, we that feeling is actually nice it's actually we we hate it and we love it at the same time yeah. sometimes you want to run away from it <clears throat> and when you see the time clocking and the, the moment of racing is coming close you're you always want to hide away but actually when you're out there and you yeah you get going then that is one of the best feelings how how do you prepare for the race so i guess how do you deal with this feeling like the the hours that could race qualifying right now, as you mentioned before, basically every moment now in the race is a moment of truth where you have an opportunity to be, uh, to, to, you might not be, have the opportunity to win, but you have the opportunity to lose the race of the weekend. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, our race days are obviously very, very packed. So actually, basically you're running from uh, early morning till after the race, you're just, you're just running. There is not, I think that the longest time you have for yourself is is maybe 15 minutes or, or, or half an hour or, or on a whole day. Uh, we eat in meetings and uh, yeah, it's just constantly going from from one into the other. We we obviously have FP1, then you have we have meetings after FP1, and then basically when we did out all the analyses, uh, we're already going into FP2, and then we have to get ready for quali, and it just constantly. Uh, yeah, it goes on like that, which which actually I, I like because there is less thing, less time to think mm -hmm. and, and to to get distracted. Yeah. But basically, there is just it's just you're just going with the flow and there is no no stop until uh, until the race uh, is done. But um, when I feel nervous and stressed before the race, which I which I always do, regardless <laughs> of whatever race it is, I always feel nervous and stressed because I 
I want to, yeah, I, I expect for myself that I always, uh, yeah, d- deliver and, and do my job. Um, but I always want to be alone. I, I like to, to be alone, not speak with people, just be alone. Um, maybe listen to a little bit of music and then I actually do a lot of breathing. How did you, uh, how did you end up as a race driver? So when, when was this moment where it clicked that this was, uh, this is what you wanted to do? I never had any choice. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was very young and my father was into racing. He, he uh, had car dealerships. Uh, he used to race himself. He even had a okay. racing team to fund his own racing or to pay for his own racing. Um, so I guess when I was born, they were, uh, yeah, or they, I say they, but my father was very committed to, to motivate me in this world. And yeah, I think, um, many of us actually live the, uh, the dream of their, their, their father. I think, uh, yeah. that is quite common. Um, and I think in any sports it's, it's normal. You see a lot of sons of, uh, yeah, sons of famous, um, yeah. in, in any sport, in, in any sport. <laughs> Well, my father was not that successful and, and famous, but at least he, yeah, he was over determined to, 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 to make me a, a better version. <laughs> is, that it? is that something that clicks or is it just that you start getting some good results and then, then you just keep riding that wave? It obviously starts with playing and then you sometimes start to compete at like local club races and then national and then you go into the Benelux in like Belgium, Germany, the Netherlands and then at some point you can compete like um, in, in, in Europe or globally um, in, in, like the, in, in the kind of junior category against all your yeah, uh, age competitors. Um, and and when, when we did that, I, I, nev- I never became Dutch champion in my, in my entire career. Uh, in, in the Netherlands, I was always there, but I never really, really excelled because I was always much smaller and much younger than everyone I was racing against. But when when, I, when we started to race like at an international level, we, we obviously didn't really know what to expect. But basically from the first moment we were, yeah, uh, fighting for championships. And then in, in basically in my second year, uh, at the end of my second year at an international level, I already signed uh, a contract with uh, a Formula One team and you know things go quickly then so so yeah you don't have a specific moment but you just know you're yeah you're a part of this world and i think one of the things we, we talked a little bit about before but but it's it's also i think one of the good parallels to bring um to, to our world in investors is this around the collaboration around the different units right because it as a team it doesn't really matter if you have the best um chassis developer the best strategist or the best aerodynamics if if they don't all sync up because the, the car is a delicate balance and not just the car but the car and the driver itself how how what's your thoughts around how a team can kind of build up to the level of collaboration i think communication is is uh, is key in any organization um as long as people talk with each other and communicate i think that already um yeah takes half of the problems uh, away but if i um if I go back to kind of my personal experience, I'm, I'm someone who likes to go into the detail and uh, I can easily get lost in finding or wasting time on too much, uh, too much details that don't actually bring a lot of performance or that are mainly just stressing you out, but not actually gaining, gaining you much. So I've learned, uh, yeah, learned throughout my kind of, yeah, la- uh, throughout the last couple of years, really to, to prioritize. So simplicity, I think communication, you obviously, you said, you said simplicity is, is very important. Yeah. You, you always need to, uh, at least in, in, my, in my field, it's always very important to focus on a couple of points, uh, but not more than that. And, and you need to have a direction, uh, but then also you need to trust your uh, intuition and your talent to, 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 yeah, to bring you uh, where where uh, where we hope to be, it goes much further than that. We we are you know analyzing with the engineers uh, what can we do better uh, as a team. Obviously, the the car is very complex, so you have uh, balance changes we can do, but we also have a lot of changes we can do concerning the energy deployment and allocation on a lap. Uh, how much we 
how much energy we recuperate and there, there is a lot that goes into it but at least what what i what i learned is to to, to prioritize and not get lost in in the details how do you see the, this this energy revolution that that we're trying to embark on and um and and where the world is heading and sustainability our needs for sustainability as we discussed previously so joining formula e has has helped me a lot um just getting a better global understanding of of what it takes and and why we need to do it and how important it is to communicate it and i think that is actually the the, the key obviously um companies like vestas actually actually make the change but but um we as a uh, platform um also need to communicate and um basically teach the people um why we need to do this and uh how we need to do this and i think every every change starts with um uh with knowledge like when pe people you know if 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 people don't know they they can't make a change so it's our responsibility to uh, maybe teaching is not the right word but at least um create visibility people, right? yeah um uh, helping people um just know more about it but i think it's great that a sport that historically hasn't been sustainable now um welcomes such um yeah different platform as formula e and electric electrification and and kind of acknowledges uh its responsibility to 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 make a change and to create awareness when you look at formula e, the interesting element there is that that the technology doesn't take away what what us as as the people really enjoy about racing uh, so the the competition the, the going faster the pushing the limits the seeing how far you can go and and i think that's also interesting that you see now so many super sports cars also going in this direction right of, of pushing performance through electrification and, uh, and i think formula e as a showcase of, of how that can be spearheaded is, is a really interesting element right that you still get that level of excitement of how far you can push the limits of of a, a racing driver and and of the hardware that you're sitting on from an innovation point of view i think it's it's super interesting and it's obvious that everyone in the automotive industry but not only in 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 our kind of field but everywhere in in every different market um yeah everyone is talking about sustainability and everyone uh, acknowledges that we yeah we need to make the chains uh, together so um it's it's a matter of time. Yeah, obviously, you can't make changes overnight, but uh, we need to start somewhere. So I assume there is a competitive advantage to, to having better knowledge of, of the weather forecasts that that or at least that helps your scenario planning when you're heading into a race weekend. 100 percent. Obviously, our strategy team is um, yeah, closely working together with Vestas in order to get the kind of best weather and condition condition uh, predictions and i think strategy is all about predicting the future and um obviously the, the more kind of uh, equations uh, the, the more elements you can take in consideration um the better you can plan the future so it's a huge help and support that we you know we have the partnership with vestas really, do you have a favorite set of conditions are you uh, is there something that you particularly enjoy a little bit like Senna was always excelling on the rain, or, or is it a bit more uh, for you that it's as, as you'll take whatever comes? I like drying conditions. So when 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 you have a track that is drying, because then every lap you you get a little bit more. Um, so so I find it I find it harder when when you when you're going from a dry track straight into wet conditions, because then suddenly from a lot of grip you lose a lot of grip. So it's almost a downgrade. Uh, but I like the uh, the challenge when the track is drying and you constantly every lap, every corner is different and there's always a bit more. Uh, I, I enjoy that. But from a racing perspective, I think uh, dry conditions are, are you know the most fair. And so, so, what's your thoughts for the rest of the season? Is there a specific race that you're looking forward to, either because of the venue or the, the track itself? We are obviously going to Vancouver and Jakarta for the first time, and actually Seoul as well. So. There are quite a few uh, venues on the calendar that are that are new, which uh, which is always exciting because uh, it always uh, challenges everyone a bit more in terms of preparation, 
uh, yeah, everyone need to do uh, needs to do their homework to to turn up, um, you know, best best prepared possible. And, and I enjoy that. I like to go to new places to to yeah um, discover new things and and kind of challenge the preparation and work uh, in 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 a, in a short time frame. Thank you, Nick, for the wonderful conversation, and thank you all for listening in. I hope you tune in again very soon for another episode of Pedro's Pit Stop. We'll have some more exciting content coming your way.